Good morning, church. I figured what better way to start out a sermon than with some good news. Come on. And so I wanted to share some good news with you guys. Dear sold out movement prayer warriors, greetings from rainy Hong Kong. Today, history's band is the 12th and final Crown of Thorns Church. Hong Kong celebrated their inaugural service. With the threat of Typhoon Mawar, many would have been disheartened, but the Hong Kong mission team, trained in the Radical City Church, or the Sydney Church, by Joe and Carrie Willis, continue to preach the word every day this week, believing that the God of Elijah was with them. With no rains this afternoon, we met at 4 p.m. on the 17th floor of one of the many high-rises in, in this metropolis. The remarkable seven disciples of the mission team and Joe and Carrie Willis of Sydney, Australia, and Annalisa of Manila, myself as supporting disciples, were blessed by God with an extraordinary attendance, extraordinary attendance of exactly 35. Come on. There were no children as most all the visitors were very open college students at the Polytech University of Hong Kong. In fact, we decided to conduct the service and future ones in English. Prayerfully, we will have a Cantonese service soon as well. The singing actually was amazing, just given 11 disciples in a crowd of 35. <laughs> Chi Long, the Hong Kong team mission leader, delivered an incredible sermon entitled, Why Do We Do What We Do? Or Why We Do What We Do? He cried at the end while sharing about his own salvation and the hope that his mom and grandma have since they are now studying the Bible in the Chicago church. <laughs> The Chicago church is where Chi and the woman leader of Hong Kong, the Hong Kong mission team, Naomi, were baptized. So many studies were set up, and much fruit is on its way. Also, the Phnom Penh Remnant Group in Cambodia formed at the GLC when Lady is Yellow and their son, Rice, joined the movement from the ICOC, had their first baptism today, and with a membership of six, had an attendance of 23 at service. Wow. Come on! You know, there's so much good news going around, and as Spencer prayed, as we pray for the missionaries, and as Marvin shared in our contribution as we give, we're seeing the kingdom built around the world. Yes. I mean, literally the efforts that we're giving here, and wasn't it awesome fundraising yesterday at the game? Yeah. I mean, for everybody who went, it was pretty amazing. <laughs> Within an hour, God allowed us to raise $320. Wow. We shared our faith with a bunch of people, and we just had a blast being able to raise money for missions. And of course, you know, the Ducks won, which is always hey! you know, there's, there's great buzz about the, the first game of the year. And, you know, excitedly next weekend, we're going to have another fundraiser. Yeah. So we're going to go a little bit more prepared. You know, we only had 160 waters, which I thought that was a good amount of waters. Yeah. <laughs> we're going to go with more like 360 yeah. waters. Yeah. Because we're going to have another fundraiser next more weekend, night. as there will be another yeah. Ducks home game. And I believe it will be a bunch of glory to God. You know, but it's awesome that we get to be a part of that. I mean, isn't good news incredible? Yeah. You know, and, and it's awesome that we get to have good news even in our, our local congregation as well. With, uh, you know, visiting of, of, of some of the disciples. I mean, excitingly, uh, you know, people moving to Eugene and, and just the church being stronger and, and the church even growing in number. Come on. Amen. Amen. Amen.
you know, get to reach out to all kinds of people on campus and meeting basketball players and soccer players and football players and studying the scriptures with athletes because I know that athletes get it. I know that athletes get it that it takes a bunch of work in order to become successful. And that's true across the board with really anything. You know, you talk to a business owner, you talk to somebody that does research, you talk to somebody that just works at a company, it takes a lot. And yet we, we, we get this sense of, of becoming a fighter. And, you know, I, I love, you know, even the McGregor Mayweather match. I'm so yeah. excited about that, you know? And, and it's just sports are awesome because they bring out something inside of you that, that, that requires you to dig deep. That just, you don't find it unless something brings it out from you. Now we're going to go through a list of the top 10 greatest athletes of all time. Oh, and if you want to say, I mean, who, who comes to mind when you think of top 10 greatest all time? Michael Jordan. Jesus. Michael Jordan. Jesus. Michael, Jesus. Michael, Jesus. Michael, Jesus. Phelps. Michael Phelps. Yeah. 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 I mean, we got some. Muhammad Ali. Muhammad Ali. Yeah. There's, there's so many great athletes, right? <laughs> and, and you know what's crazy is, is as fans, as fans, we can literally think that they are just like produced somewhere and then they just come out and they perform. We really can think like that. And we can think, man, being a champion is, it just happens. <laughs> And, you know, we're going to go through the list of these top ten athletes according to some website. <laughs> <laughs> Number one, Michael Jordan in basketball. <laughs> and I want to go through uh, some of the famous quotes of each one of these top ten athletes. <laughs> Michael Jordan, I've missed more than 9,000 shots in my career. I've lost almost 300 games, 26 times. I've been trusted to take the game-winning shot and miss. I've failed over and over and over again in my life. And that is why I succeed. Yeah. Muhammad Ali in boxing. Only a man who knows what it's like to be defeated can reach down to the bottom of his soul and come up with the extra ounce of power it takes to win. Yeah. You say bold, track and field. I know what I can do, so it doesn't bother me what other people think or their opinion on the situation. Yeah. Michael Phelps, swimming. If you want to be the best, you have to do the things other people aren't willing to do. Wayne Gretzky in hockey, you miss 100% of the shots you never take. Yeah. Bo Jackson, I just put everything. He does everything. <laughs> he says, I've always played with kids that were five, six, seven years older than me. Roger Federer in tennis. I don't want to be at the mercy of my opponent. I want to take charge. Play aggressive as myself so that, that I need to move fast on my feet and I can be quick in my mind. Babe Ruth in baseball. Never let the fear of striking out get in your way. Jim Throat, football. I was never content unless I was trying my skill or testing my endurance. And Pele in soccer. He says success is no accident. It's hard work. Perseverance, learning, studying, sacrifice, and most of all, love what you are doing or learning to do. Yeah. You know, I preached a lesson months ago that was called a heart of a champion. And today I wanted to I wanted to kind of do a rendition of that, but to call it a heart of a fighter. Yeah. And that's the title of our lesson this morning, is the heart of a fighter. Ooh. You know, all these athletes became great champions, and yeah, they they become the at the pinnacle of their sport in many ways. But first, they had to become a great fighter. Let's go to 1 Corinthians chapter 9. Come on, bro. And you know, the heart of a fighter, whether it's in athletics or in business or whatever it's in, it's absolutely the heart that we're called to have as Christians. In 1 Corinthians in chapter 9, verse 24, we pick up with Paul. The Bible says in verse 24, Do you not know that in a race all the runners run, but only one gets the prize? Run in such a way as to get the prize. Everyone who competes in the games goes into strict training. They do it to get a crown that will not last. But we do it to get a crown that will last forever. Therefore, I do not run like a man running aimlessly. I do not fight like a man beat in the air. No, I beat my body and I make it my slave. So that after I've preached to others, I myself will not be disqualified for the prize. You know what fires me up about Paul? I get the sense that Paul was inspired by athletics in order to be a better Christian 
and to make the world closer to God. Amen? And he says, man, you look at you look at runners. I just imagine Paul maybe going to you know competitions and seeing the runners and just being like, man, all these guys are running, and only one of them's gonna get the prize. That's a bummer. You know, a lot of people are running and, and they're hustling and they're really going after it, and most of the people are not gonna make it. They're not gonna win the prize. This isn't a sporting event. And then he goes on to say, everybody goes in the games, they go into strict training. So, but he realizes that everybody's training strictly. Because everybody's running in a way that they want to win the prize. They want to be able to find the success that they're looking for. They want that crown of glory that, that the Bible says it's only going to last for a little while. But just to get this temporary crown, people will go into strict training. They'll run. They'll fight. They're not like just fighting the air, you know, like... <laughs> And I think Paul knew that because he used to like probably fight Christians. So he's like, man, I aim at the, and I actually hit the Christians, you know. So, and so Paul's like, you know, I'm not just like, I'm like aiming at the target. You know what I'm talking about? Yeah. And Paul said, you know, in a boxer, there's, there's a match. There's a, there's, a, there's a training you go into because you're aiming for something. And he said, in Christianity, you're not just like, hopefully God will work out. You know? If it happens, the stars align and it all works out. And we just kind of can be aimless. Yeah. We can just say, man, I'm an athlete for Jesus, but if it works out, I go to the Ducks, you know, training, you know, camps or whatever, and go tell the coach, like, hey, coach, if I feel like coming to practice, I'll come. And, you know, if, I, if it works out and, and I really feel like pushing myself, then, then we'll make it happen. But I really got to feel it. <laughs> coach, why don't you drop back and me 25 push-ups and then get back to what I told you to do. Because there's, there's an understanding that there's, there's got to be a, a goal that you're aiming towards. And I see Paul was inspired by athletics to be a better disciple of Jesus. And I think for us, you know, as we read through the Bible, there's so many analogies between athletics and Christianity. Yeah. You know, I'm an athlete at heart. Uh, I did gymnastics for 20 years. I also did swimming. I played baseball. I played basketball. And I ran track and field. But, Come on, but I did gymnastics. That was my sport. Woo! And one of the things I loved about gymnastics was every day, it didn't matter how good you got, you had to start with the basics. Every day, no matter what, you had to stretch. You never got good enough to where you didn't need to stretch anymore. Actually, the better you got, the more you relied on stretching because you were going to push yourself hard. And it's very true in the same way in the walk of a Christian is that our basics are spending time with God. Our basics that we need to do every day is to read the scriptures. It's to pray to God. It's to have a right heart before God. And then we can go out and we can move on to greater things. You never mature from the basics. You never do. You never outgrow the importance of stretching and gymnastics. You never outgrow doing more handstands. You never go, I, I see, you know, Addie is a dancer. She's like, you've got to do the basics. And so oftentimes in Christianity, we say, man, I just want to move on to the bigger things. I want to move on to the miracles. So I'm not going to read my Bible anymore. I'm just going to go after the miracles. And it's like, man, it doesn't work like that. God's the one who's going to do the miracles, and you've got to do the basics of spending time with God. You've got to do the basics of praying to God, waiting on God, learning to be patient, and then God will take you to new spiritual heights. Amen? Yeah. But you've got to push yourself. And, and in gymnastics, man, it was, I'm so grateful that I got to be part of an incredible team. We, we got to win NCAA championships. I got to be an All-American. And, and I was eighth place. I don't, I don't want you guys to think like I'm some sort of like incredible guy. Only the top eight were All-Americans. And I was eighth place, like with the biggest smile on my face, you know? <laughs> and so in gymnastics, the way it works is the top eight in the nation uh, get to be considered and go down as All-Americans. I was eight. I was five. Wow. I was almost nine too. Yeah. But but you know what I realized is that in order to get to a level of that, you have to be great at the basics. Yeah. I would go into practice after school. This is what I, this is how dedicated I was. This is how, how how a lack of aimlessness. This is how much I had an aim, a goal. I would leave school and I would go to the gym. And in the gym, what you had were called floor equipment. So if you've ever seen the palm of worms, it's like actually kind of like maybe like three feet high. And so if you're, if you're doing what's called circles, your feet can dip down. On the floor, you have to be like flat as a board. 
And so I would go for 40 minutes on the floor, and you put like just the, the leather part on the floor, and you'd have to learn how to do basics. Each position, quarter circles, half circles, three quarter circles, full circles, full and a quarter. So, so mundane. But you know what happened? Is I learned each step of the way how to do the basics. And so when I was able to go and, and to do the skills, I was able to do the skills. And I saw so many people burn out of gymnastics because they just try to do the skills over and over again. They get hurt, they get beat down, they get discouraged, they give up because they hadn't perfected the basics. Mm -hmm. This is so similar to Christianity. If the basics are not part of your daily life, you will burn them. You will get discouraged. You will, you will get injured spiritually. You'll get spiritually burnt out. You'll hit a spiritual wall. And you won't have the basics to fall back on, which is the Word of God and spending time with God in prayer. You know, as Christians, we've got to have a great goal. And that goal has got to be And I think sometimes people think they can get to heaven without the Word of God. <laughs> I get, to, I get to heaven on my experience. No word of God, no prayer. How silly does that sound? Yeah. Guys, we will not get to heaven without God's word, without following God's path, and without building with our great God. Mm -hmm. You know, the question is, what is it going to take to have the heart of a fighter? Well, point number one is you've got to get hungry for what matters most. We live in a world that's so hungry for stuff that doesn't matter. Bigger houses, more money, more this, more that, more reputation, more popularity, more products. We live in a world that's so hungry for this kind of stuff. Okay. But yet the truth is, is that, you know, in heaven there's going to be short people and there's going to be tall people. Yeah. In heaven there's going to be ugly people and there's going to be pretty people. There's just going to be different kinds of people in heaven. There's going to be the rich and the poor. Although, the Bible does say, Jesus does say that if you desire to be rich, you desire the hardest way to get to heaven, basically. Uh -oh. And so, I, think, I hope we can find a good balance right there. But the truth is, is there's going to be rich and poor people in heaven. Yeah. Some of us spend our whole lives just not trying to be in a certain space in life, but it doesn't matter about being in heaven. And our goal is not really that we're hungry for, for righteousness, we're hungry to get to heaven. We get hungry for the things that are around us. Come on. You know, there's going to be educated and uneducated people in heaven. Get this. There's going to be people in heaven with no degrees. Oh. Yeah. There's going to be people in heaven without a single degree to their name. Yeah. But then there's going to be people in heaven with multiple degrees to their name. The point I'm trying to make is that the things that we get so hungry for that we build our lives around, we've got to ask, is that fitting into the ultimate goal? Of getting to heaven. You know there's going to be all races in heaven. It's going to be awesome. There's going to be an international, worldwide, universal, universal collection of people in heaven. And all these things that we think matter on earth won't matter in heaven. And so what's the challenge for us today? What is it going to take? Well, we've got to get hungry for what matters the most. Let's go to Matthew chapter 5. Come on, Brian. Hungry for what matters the most. You know, here's Jesus, and he's, uh, he's preaching. Jesus can preach about anything in the universe. And he decides to preach about this because it's important. Matthew chapter 5 and verse 6. The Bible says, Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they will be filled. You know, it's amazing that when you study out the word righteousness, it means to fulfill every duty and every relationship. And the righteousness that the Bible's talking about here is blessed are those who hunger and thirst to, to fulfill their duties in their relationship with God. To hunger and thirst for that sake. I just want to be in great standing with God. You know, it's amazing that God sets the standard of righteousness. But have you accepted it? Have you accepted that this is the standard of what's right? And have you started to hunger for it? Have you started to thirst for it? You know, I, I love getting thirsty or getting hungry because I love eating or just getting a nice cold, you know, beverage. One of my favorite things is to, to drink an ice cold blue Gatorade whenever you're super thirsty. Yes. And I think about, man, we understand in life being hungry or thirsty, we're going to figure it out. 
When you hunger or thirst for nutrition, you're going to figure it out. Yeah. And the same way, when we hunger or thirst for righteousness, when that's truly our heart, we're going to figure it out. Come on, bro. We're going to figure out how to get back up once, how to get back up twice. And as many times as we fall down, we're going to figure out how to get back up one more time than we fell down. So the last place we are is we're standing and we're walking with God. Come on, bro. Yeah. But you know, the truth in life is whatever you hunger for, whatever you're thirsty for, whatever you desire, and you go after that, that's what's going to get stronger in your life. Mm. It's true. I mean, you've heard the, or I don't know if you have or not, but there's this, this understanding that there's two wolves inside of you. Yeah. And, and there's, a, there's a wolf for, for what's right and there's a wolf for what's wrong. We'll call it good and evil. We'll call it righteousness and sin. And each and every one of us has got this going on inside of us. And whichever one you feed becomes stronger. And whichever one you starve becomes weaker. And as one becomes stronger and stronger and stronger, you and you guys work together to destroy the one that's weaker. Amen. Amen. And when your desire is to be hungry and thirsty for what's right, and you feed that, you put the word of God into that, you surround yourself with the people that are going to push you towards that. You get heart felt with God on a deep level. You get open and you fulfill yourself with what's right. That grows stronger and stronger inside of you. And you start starving this other desire inside of you. Yeah. Yeah. Some people feel like, man, I'm human, man. I've got both of these desires. Everybody's got both of those desires. <laughs> and Jesus still calls people to hunger and thirst for righteousness. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. You know, we've settled for, for unfulfillment in this world. We have. We've settled for, for world war relationships. We've settled for, I see so many women that just settle for, for, for a marriage because they don't want to not be married. Yeah. Yeah. So they'll settle for a guy that doesn't really treat them right. They'll settle for a guy that maybe does some things that really hurt them. Yeah. But they say, you know what? I'm settling for this because I don't want to be with that. Wow. There's not a hunger or thirst for righteousness. Wow, bro. There's a, there's a desire to not be empty. And so we're trying to do whatever we can to not be empty. And we don't go to the Word of God and just build off the Word of God because it's not an immediate answer. And so people fall into drugs and they go towards alcohol and they go towards relationships and pornography and all these different things because they're not really hungry for God. They're hungry to be filled. Wow. And then what happens is they're not filled. And then they have to go back to this stuff and get abused again by the stuff. And then they just built this lifestyle of abuse and they just say, I'm not even hungry anymore. I don't feel like doing anything. Yeah. I'm empty. Yeah. And the whole time, God's just trying to fill people up. You know, it's amazing. When you hunger and thirst for righteousness, it's a promise you will be filled. And this isn't like a counterfeit filling. It's not like, a, oh, settle for this stuff. It's no. To fill in the Greek, it means to fill or satisfy your deepest desires. And that's what God wants to do for people. He wants people to get hungry for His Word, hungry for His purpose, hungry for what's right according to the Scriptures, and then to go after it and get to be, to be fed by it. Yeah. And when you're fed by it, step by step, God will fill you, you'll be satisfied, and you'll become truly the light of the world. Come on, come on bro. Let's go to Colossians chapter 2. You know, what happens when you get hungry for righteousness? When you get hungry for righteousness, there's a desire to study the Word. There's a desire to get people yeah. in your life who will study the Word with you. Yeah. And so my challenge to everybody here this morning is get a hunger and a thirst for what's right. Come on. Get yeah. people in your life who will study the Scriptures with you and call you to be like Jesus. Yeah. You know, in Colossians chapter 2, in verse 9, the Bible says, For in Christ all the fullness of the deity lives in bodily form, and you have been given fullness... In Christ, who is the head over every power and authority. And then you're also circumcised in the putting off the sinful nature. Not with the circumcision done by the hands of men, but with the circumcision done by Christ. Having been buried with him in baptism and raised with him through your faith and the power of God, who raised him from the dead when you were dead in your sins and in the uncircumcision of your sinful nature, God made you alive with Christ. You know, when somebody gets to the place where they're, they're hungry, they're thirsty for righteousness, and they study the scriptures. They start to get filled. You know, I remember when I studied the Bible, and I didn't realize how empty I was until I studied the Bible. And I honestly believed that my life was awesome. I lived in New York. I was, I had money to, to spend, and, and I could get any kind of the food I wanted to. I could, I lived in a great place, and, 
and I, and I really believe that I was, I was filled. And when I studied the scriptures and I saw what Jesus intended for relationships, when I saw what Jesus intended for purpose, what he intended for lifestyle, I was just, I'm empty of this stuff. And I started to get hungry. And I started to say, I want this. You know, Joali put a, a post up as, uh, you know, Jessica and Joali and some of the sisters were, were, were doing the kingdom study with Martha. And she just put up a, a post about, I love the kingdom study. And it reminded me back to when I, when I studied out the, the kingdom in the scriptures, and I made the decision that I wasn't going to have empty relationships anymore. I remember reading Acts 2, 42, where it says they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching, the fellowship, the breaking of bread, and the prayer. And somebody said, is this what you want for your life? I felt like a million things were going through my head. I was like, well, no, that's going to get in the way of my business. It's going to get in the way of my social life. That's going to get in the way of all these different things. And, I'm, and, and I just said, yeah. Because that's what's right. I want that in my life. And I didn't know what that fully meant. I knew it was going to mean changing up things. And, and there were times where I felt like I had to replace my emptiness with just faith. Yeah. But I knew that it was right that I was doing it. And God always fulfilled me. And I've seen it time and time again with people that it's the, it's the truth. And when somebody studies the Bible and then they come to the place where they're, they're ready to get baptized. And, and the Bible says it's through their faith that they go into the water. And through their faith, they're risen, and God's work brings them to a whole new life, totally washed clean of all their sin. This is the result of somebody who hungers and thirsts for righteousness. But you know, I think sometimes we can kind of fool ourselves and think it stops there. We can think, man, my heart's been circumcised by Christ, Jesus in my life, all my sins forgiven, and now I'm in this, like, safe zone. Which is true, spiritually. But it still requires the heart of a fighter. Let's go to Colossians chapter 3 and verse 1. So this person just got baptized. Since they've been raised with Christ. Here in verse, chapter 3 and verse 1, it says, Since then you've been raised with Christ, set your hearts on things above. Wow, there's actually something now you need to do. <laughs> you actually need to set your heart. Have you ever heard somebody say, Oh, it's just in my heart. The sin is just in my heart. I enjoy it in my heart. I can't change my heart. It's wicked. No, God says you, individually, me, and all of you, yeah. and anybody else in the world, you set your heart on things above. Amen. You decide to go after what's right. You get hungry. That's great. You've been baptized. All your sins have been washed away. You have the Spirit of God now. All right? Now set your heart on things above. In verse 2, set your minds on things above. Not on earthly things. You see, God absolutely gives people the responsibility of where you put your mind and your heart. You feed, the, you feed the wolf of sin. You set your mind on sin. And you keep going after it. And it's in your heart. That's your bad. That is not God's fault. It's not Satan's fault. It's your fault. Yeah. Come on, choices, yeah. We're not victims here. Yeah, Come on. Right. We're not. Jesus isn't throwing us a pity party. <laughs> Jesus says you're one another. Forgive us, the Lord forgave you, and all, all these virtues put on love, which binds them together in perfect unity. Let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts, since as members of one body you are called to peace, and be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly as you teach, and admonish one another with all wisdom, and as you sing psalms, hymns, and spiritual songs, with gratitude in your hearts to God. And whatever you do, whether in word or deed, do it all in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God. The Father through Him. Come on. You know, it is amazing that we're called to action as we've been brought into the light of Christ. Now we're called to set our minds, to set our hearts, and to clothe ourselves. Now, I love everybody here, but I would be weirded out if you didn't get dressed this morning. <laughs> I think everybody would. They'd be like, this is not okay. You need to go back and you need to go get dressed. And spiritually, we can do that, though. We don't put on compassion. We just come in to the fellowship without compassion. It's like, whoa, you need to go get dressed. Yeah. You need to go put some compassion on. Yeah. Bro, sis. <laughs> we're called to clothe ourselves with kindness. Wow. It's amazing. A lot of these things that we're called to clothe ourselves with, the world looks at as weakness. Yeah. yeah. To be compassionate means you're weak. Yeah. yeah. I mean, somebody's going to walk all over you. Jesus never meant for that to be the case. 
Compassionate means you care. And so you go out of your way to help people. That's it. Kindness. Kindness doesn't mean you just let people walk all over you and use you. Kindness means you have a moral integrity that you're going to fight for with a bunch of love in your heart. Come on. That's what true kindness is. Come on. Humility. Humility means, man, I'm going I'm to share the truth. And if I'm wrong, I'm going to own up to it. I'm going to apologize, and then I'm going to be strong. Humility is not like, oh, it's my fault. Man, I'm sorry. And then you weep the rest of the time. No, Je Jesus says, I'm gentle and I'm humble in heart. But do you ever see Jesus just like, oh, sorry, guys. I'm just going to hide in the corner because I'm so humble over here. I don't want to be in the attention. No, Jesus was out preaching the word, and he was like, his life was threatened. People were persecuting him. People gave him a hard time. Humbly. Yeah. He was humble. We're called to clothe ourselves with this kind of stuff. Gentleness. You know, gentleness is amazing. It's, it's like meekness. It's strength under control. Gentle does not mean that you just let people walk all over you and you don't have an opinion. Gentle means that you have a, you have a strength that's under control, and you know when to use it, and you know when to be humble. Yeah. Patience. It's long-suffering. You know, I just want to talk to the men. I mean, so many people say that being a man just means you, like, let somebody have it. Well, it doesn't take any patience. It doesn't take any manliness to do that. Anybody can let somebody have it. Yeah. It takes being a man to say, wow, I'm going to be patient. And for the sisters as well. And forgiving. You know, it takes a hero to forgive. It takes a fighter to forgive. Yeah. Because forgiveness means that you've been deeply hurt. But it means at the same time, you're willing to face it. You're willing to patch it up, turn that wound into a scar. And you're willing to keep going forward and fight. Yeah. Okay. You know, one of the things I want to inspire us with as we, as we hunger for what matters most. The heart of a fighter. So I want us to be reminded that this is who we are. I think a lot of times we, we feel defeated because we, we look at ourselves for our shortcomings. Who knows they have shortcomings? Who knows your shortcomings more than anybody else knows your shortcomings? Uh, who thinks about your shortcomings more than anybody oh, else? Uh, and so we start to think that that's who we are. Yeah. I want to remind you guys, your life, when you got baptized into Christ, when you became a disciple, your life was hidden in Jesus. Come on, bro. So like when the Almighty God looks down, He doesn't see your shortcomings the way you see them. He actually sees his son. Come on. He sees a bunch of the blood that was shed. He said, your life is worth it, and I believe in you. You're saved, and I want you to fight for me. Come on, bro. I want you to fight for me. It's that area you're thinking about right now. 
That's that area right now, and that's the area that you need to attack with full force. Come on. Scriptures, with spiritual people, Come on, bro. with great prayers, and let's get hungry to do a prayer in the next chapter. Okay? You know, point number two is from dull to daring. I've been reading this book, it's called The Heart of a Champion, and I want to read a, a couple pages out of this book. It says, Emil Zadbeck lived in the town of Zlin in Morovia, it's in the, uh, Czechoslovakia, and worked in the chemistry lab of a shoe store company, or a shoe company. Every spring, the company sponsored races, and all able-bodied residents were exhorted to run. The story is told that in 1941, Zadbeck was not keen on the whole idea and hid himself in the town library. But someone found him and cajoled him until he took his place at the starting line. The improbable was about to happen. Zadopek finished second in the town race and soon was training for more serious competition. His times rapidly improved and many of his countrymen stood in awe of his ability. In 1948, so this is just seven years later, he went to the London Olympic Games and brought home the gold medal for the 10,000 meter run and the silver for the 5,000. After watching Zadopek, one American sports writer wrote that he was gasping, clawing at his abdomen, Bobbing, weaving, staggering, gyrating, flinging, suffocating glances towards the heavens. There was apparently nothing boring about a meal out of bed. He had become a passionate runner who knew how to win. Four years later in Helsin Helsinki, he would do greater things. This time he won the gold in both the 10,000 and the 5,000, become the only, only the second man in history to ever do so. The second victory came on the same day that his wife Dana won the gold in the javelin. Dana thought the Zadopeks, with their three golds, were finished with the competition. But as they celebrated that night, Emil, as an afterthought, decided to run the marathon and try to do what no man had ever done, win the gold in the three longest races in the games. Now being familiar with the race, he asked Jim Peters of Great Britain if he could run beside him. At one point in the race, Zadopek said to Peters, isn't this pace too fast? Peters answered that it was too slow. Zadopek believed him and ran away from Peters and everyone else and on to win the gold medal. Whoever found the Mills out of that hiding in the library of an obscure town gave the Olympic Games one of its greatest champions, a hungry runner with passion and zeal. Wow. Let's turn our Bibles to Judges chapter 6. Come on, bro. And you know, we're going to look at a, an account that some of us are familiar with. It's the account of Gideon. And Gideon was one of those guys who was hiding. <laughs> and God had great vision for Gideon. In Judges chapter 6 and verse 11, the Bible says the angel of the Lord came and sat down under the oak and Ophrah that belonged to Joash the Abdurah, where his son Gideon was threshing wheat in a wine press to keep it from the Midianites. When the angel of the Lord appeared to Gideon, he said, the Lord is with you, mighty warrior. You know, we're just going to read this part of the account. I, I, I highly recommend you read the account on your own. But, but here was Gideon, and Gideon was, he was threshing the wheat, but he was doing it in a wine press because he was hiding. Gideon was scared. He was scared. Therefore, he was doing his work in a hiding place. Well, God sees what's going on, and God sends an angel to Gideon and says, I am with you, mighty warrior. Not as priceless to have somebody believe in you when you don't believe in yourself. Yeah. And here's Gideon with no faith in himself. All he's got is fear. All he's got is, is doubt. All he's got is the mindset that I've got to hide. And I'm still going to do just my work. I'm just going to hide while I do it. Because I don't want to go face the Midianites. And then God says, you know what? I'm with you, mighty warrior. You know, I believe that's the, God, the heart that God has for everybody in here. I believe that, as the scriptures say in 1 Timothy chapter 2, that God wants all men to be saved and come to a knowledge of the truth. Therefore, I believe God looks down on this world and sees all people as potential mighty warriors. If we go later to Judges chapter 7, Gideon answered the call. He heard the word of God, and he made some great decisions, and he changed his life. You know, for us, you may, you may be 
hiding today. You may say, you know, I don't, I don't really want to study the Bible. I know it's in the Bible, and I know it's going to challenge me. And I, I'm not ready to change my life. If that's the case, you're not hungry for God. You're not hungry or thirsty for righteousness. But the story of Gideon is a story for any of us. Is that when the Word of God comes to our life, and you can see your true identity, who God calls you to be, then you can become what Gideon became. And let's look at it here, Judges chapter 7, let's go, bro. in verse 15. Come on, bro. It says, When Gideon heard the dream and its interpretation, he worshipped God. He returned to the camp of Israel and called out, Get up! The Lord has given the Midianite camp into your hands. Dividing the 300 men into three companies, he placed trumpets and empty jars in the hands of all of them with torches inside. Watch me, he told them, follow my lead. When I get to the edge of the camp, do exactly as I do. When I and all who are with me blow our trumpets, from, then from all around the camp, blow yours. Shout for the Lord and for Gideon. Gideon went from this guy who was hiding in a wine press to hearing the word of God, believing the word of God, and then leading God's people. This is the story of anybody who becomes a true disciple of Jesus. You're in your life at some point. You're doing your thing, and, and you're not doing a, a big impact spiritually. And God calls you and says, I've got big dreams for you, you warrior. I'm going to put you in the spiritual battle, and you're going to be the one who's fighting on the front lines. You're the one face-to-face. -face, you're going to share your faith with people. You're going to have people in your home, or I go to a Starbucks, or go to campus, or go to your workplace. And do some Bible studies with them on the front lines as a warrior. And that's the story that God has for everybody who would follow him, Who would respond to the word of God. See, we have no other way to respond except for the way Gideon did. To say, wow, I'm going to become a person who takes the word of God to heart. I'm going to have great vision based off the scriptures. And I'm going to fight and I'm going to call the people behind me to come and fight with me. It's the story of every single disciple. You know, in Eugene, I believe there's many libraries. I believe there's many wine presses, living rooms and offices who are filled with people who look boring, ordinary, apathetic, who don't have dreams, who don't really have direction and drive, but they're full of potential. They are full because what would this church and his impact be if we were a thousand people? Can you imagine how much of an impact there would be going on? How many Bible studies would be going on? You know, just like Gideon, people see themselves as the least of the least. And God sees people as potential spiritual legends. So the next time you look at a person who looks like they, they're not interested, or they look like they don't care, it's just because they're dull, spiritually. And they need to become daring. I was dull spiritually. I don't think it's offensive to say that. I was yeah. dull in my sin. Yeah. Somebody showed me the scriptures and I came to life spiritually. Come on. Fired up now. Come on. I'm excited man. to keep preaching the word. I'm Come excited to share my faith. I'm excited to be a disciple of Jesus. Come on, bro. You know, the way we look at ourselves and others can be so wrong. You know, we see weaknesses, we see faults, we see shortcomings. But we need to realize that anybody can change if there's a spiritual fire lit inside of somebody. Anybody can change. It doesn't matter where you've been. It doesn't matter what you're going through. It doesn't matter what you're going through right now. If you get a spiritual fire lit inside of you, you can change and become the change in this world that we need to see. You know, God's eager to turn so many dull people into passionate disciples that love the battle. That's God's heart. God wants to turn people into that. To be part of a spiritual family, that, to be part of a spiritual army that goes and attacks the gates of Hades. That's willing to go and preach against the darkness of this world today. You know, the gospel is still the power of God, but do you believe that? Do you believe the gospel is still the power of God to change from somebody from being dull to becoming daring? Come on. And the message of the cross can change anybody. But you know what the truth is? is that message is lacking in the lives of, of most of the world. And Paul said, I, I fill it up in my flesh. To make the afflictions of Christ real in your life. And that's really the call of all of us as we become Gideons. As we say, at some point we're hiding. But God's called us to be passionate and to be daring for the mission. You know, the gospel can turn somebody who's crude into somebody who's sensitive. Somebody who's selfish into somebody who's caring. Somebody who's proud into somebody who's humble. 
somebody who's humanistic and a realist, and to somebody who's spiritual and faithful. You know, but the question I, I have for us today is, are you hiding? Spiritually, are you hiding? Are you hiding behind facts and logic and, and what people say? Are you hiding behind the comments of, of what people say on your Facebook? Or, you know, you hide behind your Facebook. I don't know. Behind your Instagram. You know, it's, it's like the two desires, the wolf that you feed. You know, a lot of people, when they have a hard task, or they have responsibility, they just go scroll their Facebook or their Instagram. And they start to feed that desire. And then the, the tasks start to pile up and pile up and pile up. And then your desire is just to be on Facebook or to be on Instagram. Or it's to hide in the comfort of your living room. Or it's to watch another episode on Netflix. And we start to hide. When God wants us to become daring people who make his name known in our day. Come on. You know, the truth is anybody can change. You're God's match. Let's go start a great fire for God. <laughs> Point number three is, let's get resolved to never quit. Amen. Let's go to Galatians chapter 6. You know, excitingly, uh, Joali and I will celebrate two years of being married on Tuesday. Ooh. And, uh, you know, it's, it's been so awesome being married to Joali because, you know, before he got married, she became my best friend. And it was literally, I mean, we got to have our first kiss at the altar. I mean, we literally became best friends before we got married. And, you know, glory to God because neither of us visioned our lives to look like that. And what makes marriage so special is because we made a commitment to never quit on each other. I mean, what would marriage be if there were no vows? What would marriage be if it was like, hey, uh, this is an awesome day, and uh, I'm in love with you right now, and uh, things may change. <laughs> You'd be like, uh, why are we doing this right now? <laughs> marriage is awesome because there's a commitment that says, I'm never going to quit. I'm going to be with you. And that's why we, we get to have such a special marriage. Does that mean that it's always easy? No. <laughs> Amen, married, married people in the house. <laughs> it's not always going to be easy. But we can get resolved to never quit. And, and how much more we get resolved to never quit on our spiritual walk? Yeah. Come on, yeah. Resolve to never give up being a great disciple. In Galatians chapter 6, as we close out. Good stuff. Here in verse 7, the Bible says, do not be deceived. God cannot be mocked. A man reaps what he sows. The one who sows to please the sinful nature, from that nature will reap destruction. The one who sows to please the Spirit, from the Spirit will reap eternal life. Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. Come on, bro. Therefore, as we have opportunity, let us do good to all people, especially to those who belong to the family of believers. Yeah. Absolutely, the Bible here calls us to be resolved to never quit. But before that, the Bible says, do not be deceived. Why? Because that's the temptation. And I don't know about you guys, but in the world, before I became a disciple, I became great at deceiving people. Yeah. And, 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 I, and I could literally mock people. Why? Because I tell them one thing and I do another thing and I get what I wanted out of it, even though I told them one thing. I mocked them. I'm not proud of it. It's super shameful. And it's sad. God cannot be mocked. God sees what happens when you wake up. He sees what happens when the doors are closed. He sees what happens in the afternoon, the evening, the middle of the night, on the weekend. He sees what happens when nobody else is around. God can't be mocked. And whatever you sow is what you will reap. You may be able to fool people for a matter of months, years. Decades, I don't know, generations. You may be able to fool people. But God cannot be mocked. It is just physically impossible. And whatever it is you sow is what you will end up with. If you sow to please your sinful nature, the Bible says you will go to hell. It's just a fact. It's not like a, nobody's perfect, I'm just human. God knows we're all human. And he still calls us to sow to please the Spirit. Yeah. And he says, you and your humanity, you could sow to please, you know, your sinful nature. But I'm also going to call humans to sow to please the Spirit. And so if you've ever used that excuse, I'm human, I'm not perfect, I want you to just get rid of it. Yeah. Just get rid of it when it comes to Christianity because God already knows you're human. 
He already knows you're not perfect. That's why he sent his son to shed his blood on the cross. And the hope is, is that your life would be changed so that your pursuit would be God and not your imperfection. Come on. Yeah. It's not okay to say I'm just human. Okay. Everybody's human. But some humans will go to heaven and some humans will go to hell. Based on how you sow in the time you have here. I want to inspire us all to sow to please the Spirit. To sow to say, well, I want to go after a relationship with God. Does it mean you're going to be perfect? Absolutely not. I drop the ball all the time. Guys, i got to confess. I sinned yesterday. I was selfish. Your pastor, I was, I was selfish yesterday. I'm being open about my sin. I have sin in my life. Yeah. Yeah. We all have sin in our life. Yeah. God wants us to fight together to help each other. God's not going to be mocked. There's no reason to show face and act like you have it all together. And Let's be open. The way that you're going to sow is by being open. It's by being honest. It's by your pursuit of God. And God moves your heart as you put on humility and your openness. You know, confessing your sins is just an opportunity to be human, humiliated. And humiliated in the sense of not like a bad thing, but you're becoming more humble. And so you're clothing yourself with humility. Which is awesome because now God can lift you up. And there's absolutely a call here in the scriptures to not become weary in this. Why? Because if you're not spiritual, you will burn out. If you're not resolved to be a fighter, man, this is too hard for you. It's too hard for me. It's too hard for anybody. We've got to be resolved to go after and hunger and thirst for righteousness. To be willing to go, let the word of God take us from being dull to being daring. And we've got to be resolved to never quit. As we close out here, I want to inspire you guys by some things that I read. Based on verse 9 here, it says, Let us not become weary in doing good, for at the proper time we will reap a harvest if we do not give up. The temptation is to give up on discipleship. It's to give up on people when they sin against you. It's to give up on the pursuit of God when it gets challenging. It's to give up on yourself. You feel like you can't change. You know, the truth is, you may get hit, you may get knocked down, you may feel pain or fatigued, but you can resolve to never quit. Yeah. You may sin, you may fail, you may disappoint yourself, you may disappoint other people, but you can still be resolved to keep righteousness as your goal and never quit. You may get mission-focused and seek the loss and be rejected, be hurt, be persecuted, opposed, ridiculed, slandered, and even ignored, and you can still resolve to love the mission. You may love the brothers and sisters and see them fall short of your expectations and do things that require you to forgive them, but you can still get resolved to never quit. Life may surprise you with illnesses, death, injury, or even depression, and you can still resolve to never quit. And the challenge from today is simple. Let's resolve to be disciples of Jesus. Let's decide from here on out that we're going to take Every breath we have until our last breath. To be hungry for what's right in the eyes of God. To fight the good fight of faith until there's nothing left. Until our bodies are no longer warm. Until we finish the race. Let's never quit on being disciples of Jesus. And to God, we only look at